auditorium tonight, um, on the green walls outside us in our Perkins Gallery is a lovely show called A Brush with Herstory, the paintings of Gabriela Gonzalez de Loso. And those works have been here in the museum for about two weeks now. And as you will have noticed, or as you will notice after this opening, uh, the paintings are exquisitely painted. They are old master style by a new master whom you will hear from momentarily. Also, the subject here is vitally important. As we think about art history, or just history in general, but since we're in a museum, as we think about art history over the course of time, since humans started making art, we have a lot of difficulty thinking about where women's place in that history has been. It's disappointing, and it is still true to this day that women's place in a mostly patriarchal or mostly male-dominated industry is lacking. And here at the museum, and certainly through Gabriella's work, we're trying as hard as we can to remedy that situation. There are a lot of women artists who deserve to have their work come to the fore, and through an exhibition like this, we are able to look back in history and revive the stories of those that many of us in this room may not have ever heard about before. So as a bit of a preface to Gabriella's coming up to speak about her own work, um, I just want to give a sense of where this subject has come from scholastically and academically. Over on the left side, you see a photograph of Linda Nochlin, who just passed away two years ago, December. She was my uh, dissertation advisor. She was my graduate advisor, actually, for my doctoral degree. Um, and I'm so grateful that she is a seminal art historian. She's basically the seminal feminist art historian who literally wrote the work called Why Have There Been No Great Women Artists. It was published in 1971, and it was a transformative essay of the 1970s, really spurring on a lot of the academic sides of the feminist revolution. So I throw out that question. You see it has a little asterisk there. That's not an asterisk that teases some pert answer. That's actually just showing that this publication was from a longer version of it in a reader. But the question was, why have there been no great women artists? And while that may seem to us somewhat logical today, that question had not been posed before Linda Nochlin posed it in 1971. You might come up with a few easy answers as to why there have been no great women artists. Well, because they were overlooked through time. Linda Nochlin proposed that that was not the case, that that is, well, that's the nice answer to say, there have been no great women artists, and this was her provocative statement, because there have been no great women artists. That doesn't mean that there are women who are not great artists, but that's because they did not have the capacity to be able to exceed in the art world. There have been many great women artists, but they are not known to us as great women artists because of their place in society. That if you were of the same, um, certainly the same wealth or level of wealth as a man who could, be able, who could have the ability to go study in the academy, you were waiting to be married off. You were at home. It was inappropriate. Women couldn't study in the academy alongside men, mostly because of, one, their expectation of what, they're, what they were supposed to do in life, but also because women could not study the male nude or any nudity along with men in a room. Women who made their way to the academy had to study plaster casts of the body, which is very limiting in that way. So the provocative statement that Nochlin said was there have been no great women artists because there have been no great women artists. Although I think today we might beg to differ with that a little bit. If I throw out this question, how many female artists can you name pre-1950? I bet there are a few names that will pop out. Now this is where, this is the interactive part, everyone. Um, so <laughs> kindly, yes, let's, I'll just call it a few. Okay, Grandma Moses, good one. Anybody else? Uh, Miriam Shapiro. Let's do pre-1950, really. There's a reason. You're going to have more post-1950. Go pre, yeah. Uh, Barrett Morisot, excellent. One of my favorites. George O'Keefe. Uh, Frida Kahlo, good. Okay, Ruth Bernard, okay. Mary Cassatt, good. Okay, how about this woman? You may know who this is? Artemisia Gentileschi, good, I heard that. Look at the dates here, 1593 through 1656. Arguably the earliest best known female artist in art history. She was well known and renowned in her own lifetime. How is that possible though? How did a woman of the Italian Baroque period achieve a claim in the 17th century when I bet you will all be pushed hard to think of the next person in the chronology of, of women in art history? 
Well, guess what? She was the daughter of a painter named, oh, this is not working well, Orazio Gentileschi, and these slides are not helping. Orazio Gentileschi. Um, she had the advantage of being the daughter of an artist. Oftentimes, you will find that women artists who have fathers or have other, who have parents that have the ability to give them training or have that artistic inclination are more open to their daughters to go into that field. And I know that um, Gabriella will probably speak more on this because she alludes to a lot of these artists in her own work. Next, in our chronology of women artists in art history, we've got to leap forward to this woman. Does anybody know who she is? Anybody? Yeah, it's good. I, they're good, some very knowledgeable art historians here. Elizabeth Vigée Lebrun. We're leaping forward to the, look at this, to the 18th century. Anybody know how Elizabeth Vigée Lebrun really had the ability to be able to become a known quantity or no name in art history? Guess who her patron was? Who's this woman on the left side? Yes, there's Marie Antoinette. She was the court painter of Marie Antoinette. And then also, what did not help Elizabeth Vigée Lebrun was that she was married to an art gallerist. And back in the late 18th century, if you were married to a gallerist, someone who traded in commercial art, that was a bad thing. So that was actually a knock on her. But because of her extreme talent, she was accepted to the Royal Academy in the late 18th century. OK, let's leap ahead, maybe. Mary Cassatt, I think these are some names that have already come out, right? We leap to the end of the 19th century to impressionist painters. Mary Cassatt, um, an American artist who really made her name in Paris, and Berthe Morisot, slightly lesser known to the general public than Mary Cassatt, but um, actually one of my absolute favorites. Um, if anybody knows the way we can do a Berthe Morisot exhibition at the Polk Museum of Art, that would be wonderful. Any great connections, I'd love that. And a Mary Cassatt exhibition, of course. But I think Berthe Morisot um, deserves a lot more due, I think, than she has from the general population. And then, how about this? George O'Keeffe. I think a lot of us think about George O'Keeffe as the next best-known artist of the 20th century. And of course, when we think about George O'Keeffe, many people, unfortunately, think about one element of her paintings that they associate with her. And um, you might think about a painting like this. Um, and while George O'Keeffe insisted that she was focusing on floral forms and the anatomy of flowers, many people thought she was focusing on the anatomy of women. And that goes in, that trades in that concept of, well, what makes something a feminine work of art, which is bunk. There is no such thing as a feminine work of art, or what makes something a work by a woman artist. But these are principally the best known artists of that period. There have been many, many, many other artists, but they have not had the opportunity to establish themselves. Or I think as Gabriella will talk about, some of them became overlooked or they became erased from that history. So it's a very complex history of women's place in it. And so you'll notice that as I've been speaking, um, not only have the slides been delayed, but um, there have been a few terms I have thrown out. I don't know why. Yeah, we need a battery. Oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> okay. There we go. Um, so yeah. So as you've heard me. I've thrown out a few words here as I've been talking about this. Um, woman artist. It sounds horribly offensive, right? But we think about women artists to specify and distinguish them from being male artists. But preferably, we would not use the term woman artist. Um, maybe female artist is better because it describes them in contrast to male artists. But I think preferably, we would all just use the term artist. In an ideal world, we would be able to do so. And so that is my great teaser for where we are going now. Um, I, it's my pleasure to be able to introduce someone who can speak much better on this than I, because it's all about her own work. Um, we are honored tonight to have Gabriela Gonzalez Deloso in the house with us. And let me tell you a little bit about Gabriela. She traveled down to us uh, from New Jersey. She is a native New Yorker who lives and works in New Jersey and who specializes, as we all can see, in narrative realism, beautiful narr narrative realism. She studied in New York at the Art Students League and the National Academy School and received her Bachelor of Fine Arts degree from the School of Visual Arts. Her paintings can be found in many notable private and museum collections, including our own. Many of you may remember for a good period of time, we had a painting called The Recyclers set up in the little room that we call our study gallery uh, between Taxtel and the student gallery. That is Gabriella's work. It was the old master style painting featuring um, feuding parties over 
recycled goods. Um, and it's brilliant, and we love it, and we love more of Gabriella's work in the collection. Uh, Gabriella's work has been published in the New York Times, Fine Art Connoisseur, Art News, and many other major publications. She is represented by the Harmon Meek Gallery in Naples, Florida, through which we acquired our very first pieces uh, by Gabriella. Today, Gabriella teaches painting and drawing at the New York School for the Arts and the JCC of Manhattan. It is my pleasure to welcome Gabriella to the microphone. Let's welcome her. It should be that button. This one? Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So <clears throat> thank you for coming and uh, being here to share this show with you. It's very special for me. So <clears throat> it, the show is called A Brush with Her Story. And it's the theme is historical women artists. And I've been doing paintings on this theme for about 11 years now. So I will tell you how, how this started. How did this come about? So one day, I was at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and I visited it my whole life. I, I um, was there, and I was with my mother. And we came upon this beautiful painting. And I was taken aback by it. It's magnificent. If you visit the Metropolitan Museum of Art, look for this painting. It's a big, beautiful painting. And it's by an artist I had never, ever heard of. Uh, her name's Adelaide Labille Guillard. And the story intrigued me on the label. It is her in the blue dress painting a painting and looking out at the, the audience. And she has these two women behind her. And the label said they were two artists that were not allowed to exhibit their work at the time. Adelaide, as I read on the label and learned a little bit more about her, was one of four women who were in the Royal Academy of Painting and Sculpture in France. She was French. And she was allowed to exhibit her work al along with all the, the men in, in the Royal Academy. There were only four women allowed at one time. And she was one of them. And with this painting, she brought her two students into the show via her painting. So I love that story. When I read that, I, I said, I've got to, I, I want to know more about her. And so, <clears throat> you know, the painting stuck with me. I had been working on a show, uh, and I was not working on this theme at all. I, I'm a narrative painter. I do several themes, and I wasn't doing this at the time, but the painting kept resonating with me and I thought about it for some reason. It was almost like the painting haunted me. So one day I, you know, had been working on so many paintings at once because I had to finish paintings for a show. I pulled a book off a bookshelf and the book actually was Women Artists 1550 to 1950 and it was um, Anne Sutherland Harris's book and Linda Nochlin's book by an interesting coincidence that you were talking about. And, you know, it has a lot of biographies in it. And so I took the book off the shelf, not really knowing. I mean, I used to live by Strand Bookstore, and I'd go into Strand and pick up books for a dollar, five dollars. And this was one of those books that I had never really you know, read in, in depth. So I pulled, pulled the book uh, off the bookshelf, and I sat down and I opened the book, and it was to her biography. And it was such an interesting story about her. She was a teacher to women artists, and I read the story about the destruction of one of her largest paintings, which is the painting out there the burning of her masterpiece. And it just, the whole, her whole story just, it resonated with me. So I decided, I said, I can't believe that I never, ever heard of her. And I said, 
I'm going to try and do honor these women artists in this. I was looking so many, I didn't know anything about any of these artists. And I'm like, I'm going to try and use my art to honor them. So that's how I started. So if you look here, this was how, these are all different paintings I've done. And what I decided to do was to use my features and my face and insert my image into their self-portraits. So these are all me, you know, recreating them in my own sort of interpretive way. So you could see Frida Kahlo is in the center. And the reason I use Frida is because I feel like all these women should be recognized like Frida. We should all know about them. They were all great. They all had such amazing stories. So the goal is to get us to that sort of recognition and, you know, interest in their life. So that's kind of how it started. I, it was simple portraits that I started doing. Okay, so right here is the first painting where I started to say, well, I like to tell stories. So I'm going to try and do, rather than just the face, I'm going to try and do a scene recreating something of uh, their life story. So here it is. It's Adelaide Labille Guillard's painting. Uh, that I kind of used as the central subject. You could see in the gray, that self-portrait with two pupils. And what I decided to do was to have Adelaide turned and talking as she's painting to two other artists. So it's sort of a little bit of a spin on um, her painting that painting. And in Adelaide's painting, you don't see the painting. It's the opposite. You don't know what's on the canvas. So here I kind of flip that idea. OK, so here's a continuation of the types of paintings I'm doing, their narrative. You know, here's Remedios Varo. And she's a fascinating artist. You guys should look her up. She did surrealism, parasurrealism. Um, she was born in Spain, and she had such an interesting life. I mean, she lived, she fled Europe, and she went to Mexico, and Diego Rivera absolutely loved her work. Even though Diego and Frida, they, um, they resisted European painters because they were very close. They, they, the Mexican art was the thing, but he loved her paintings. Uh, she was exceptional. And uh, this particular painting is recrea recreating a painting by Remedios Varo called Celestial Pablum, where you know the figure in, in uh, Remedios' painting is feeding a moon that's in a cage. So I... Her style is not realistic at all, so I recreated it in my own style, and I just thought it was such a magical image that I wanted to do something with it. Oops, okay, that, wait, let me go back. And I, oh, there it is. See, there's the painting. I saw this painting in person. It was a real thrill for me. It was in New York City at a... Um, gallery called D. Donna, and they had a few Remedios Varo paintings. So that was a real treat. It's a treat when you see these paintings in, in the real, in live, um, rather than in a book. They're so much more subtle. So it's, it's a wonderful thing. OK, so here's Elizabeth Vigée Lebrun. So after I started doing the, the paintings, where I had the oil paintings and I, you know, I did it in oil. Here I started doing drawings to pay homage to Elizabeth Vigée Lebrun. She had a show at the Met about three years ago, a wonderful show. She was extremely prolific. She painted more than 800 paintings in her life. She painted Queen Marie Antoinette more than 25 times, it might have been something like 30. 
Um, so she was remarkable, extremely prolific painter, very dedicated. So I, I love her work. And uh, here, you can see that's kind of the painting I used for the drawing. So I looked at this, and I kind of turned it into the drawing that you just saw. OK, so here's Sofonispa and Guisola. And it's very exciting right now. The Prado Museum in Madrid, if you all have a chance, you should all visit the museum and go see a show called um, Sofonis Panguisola and Lavinia Fontana, A Tale of Two uh, Painters. And so I, I saw the show and I was thrilled. Uh, I got to see a lot, a lot of her paintings. And um, so I, I think she's so exceptional. She lived a long life. She um, was a court painter uh, for Philippe II, and uh, she did a lot of, you know, portraits. She was very fine portraitist. One of her most famous paintings is the chess game, and I think that painting, let me see if I put it on here. Here's the subway poster in Madrid right now, so that's kind of, that's a real thrill, and the, actually that painting is the one I used for the drawing, so that was kind of exciting for me. Here's the chess game. I feel it's one of the masterpieces of women artists. It's such a fine painting. It's beautifully done. You cannot appreciate this painting in a photo. You have to see it in the museum. <clears throat> and here's where I first saw it. It was in the city of Ghent. Uh, it was in a show called The Ladies of Baroque. So uh, I went there to see that, and I, there was a wonderful, um, you know, combination of women artists from the Baroque period. So here's another painting. It's, it's also a tribute to, to historical women artists. It's a still life. And what I did was, it, the artists are Anne Valier Coaster, Clara Peters, and Rachel Riusch. These three women were wonderful still life painters. And I wanted to do a homage to them. However, they're not figurative. And my specialty is, of course, figurative, but I can do still life. And I said to myself, the only way I can do this is to take their objects and, and combine it. I thought I could combine it into one painting. Every object here is taken from one of their still lives. So if you want to learn about them, you will find the painting that I used, you know, the soup tureen um, <clears throat> by Anna Valier Coaster. You know, there's the Clara Peters goblet over there. Uh, Rachel Riusch is the, the lizard and the nest and the monarch butterfly. So these are all their objects that I composed into this one painting. So you can see here, this is Clara Peters. You could see the type of painting she did. She did, you know, um, breakfast painting. She was in the earliest group um, of doing this type of painting. And I had read somewhere that she may have been one of the first painters to paint fish in history. So it's very interesting what you learn. OK, so this is Rachel Riusch. And you can see the nest, the lizard, the monarch butterfly, you know, the fruits I use. So I, it's a very famous painting of hers. So uh, that's, you know, that's the idea of. And there's the lobster by Anne Valier Coaster. So you get the idea. Of, of what I did. So here's my latest project. I have uh, put together a project called the Homage Ode Project. And it works on paper with mixed media. I'll use oils. I'll use ink, uh, depending on the work. And I will write a short poem about the artist. And I will take their art and create a design uh, very much like, it's, it's inspired by illuminated manuscripts. So you'll see gold on the pieces, and the poetry is original, and their work is designed into it. 
So I, I'm, my plan is to publish a book with all these uh, women um, artists in this book. Is this working or? Oh, there it is. Okay, so you can see Giovanna Garzoni's cherries that I used in the previous illuminated manuscript. And by the way, she's having a show in the Uffizi in the spring. So her work is wonderful. She painted for the Medici. And um, it, it's very fine work. She worked on vellum. And it's an incredible technique she used. She was, it's incre you cannot appreciate it here. You've got to really uh, see uh, you know, what their, her work is like. So this is a list. I actually made copies of this, and I can hand them out later. Um, and it's all the, uh, the shows that are around the world with women artists showing. So if you're interested, uh, you can, you know, you have all the shows listed here. And kind of what, what has to happen, I mean, if we want things to actually change, it's, it takes constant effort. It can't be, oh, one day, you know, you talk about it. It's a lot of people, a lot of effort. You know, I feel, I try to share this stuff with kids in school, teachers. Teachers can help and bring these names into the classroom, that is gonna be the key because they're the future curators and museum people and you know, influential people that are gonna bring the attention to, they are a part of history. So, you know, so that's kind of where it has to come from. And um, so that's kind of my little role in this and I love doing it. And that's kind of my whole spiel.